the new record holder for single season passing yards. God does have a purpose for me that's much greater than football. Drew Brees talks about overcoming adversity. I was given a 25% chance of coming back and playing by, by some. Living his dream. It's surreal to think that uh, it actually did happen. And keeping the faith. The city that uh, just needed somebody to believe in them. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of the 700 Club. I'm Lee Webb. Pat Robertson and Terry Mewson will be along shortly. Mitt Romney won a significant victory in the Republican presidential primary in New Hampshire tonight. He becomes the first non-incumbent Republican to win Iowa and New Hampshire back to back in more than three decades. Romney earned 38% of the vote tonight. In second place, Ron Paul with a strong showing at 23%. Third place went to John Huntsman, who skipped the Iowa caucus to focus on New Hampshire. Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum are battling for fourth. That uh, is too close to call at this point. Both candidates earning 10% uh, of the vote, and Rick Perry finished last. Earlier tonight, the candidates spoke to the nation. Tonight, we made history. If you want to make this election about restoring American greatness, then I hope you'll join us. If you believe that the disappointments of the last few years are a detour, not a destiny, then I'm asking for your vote. You I'm asking each of you to remember how special it is to be an American. Yeah. I want you to remember what it was like to be hopeful and excited about the future, not to dread each new headline. We have had a victory for the cause of liberty tonight. <laughs> but I sort of have to chuckle when they describe you and me as being dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> That's one thing they are telling the truth, because we are dangerous to the status quo of this country. And here with more is our political reporter, David Brody. He joins us via Skype from Romney headquarters in Manchester, New Hampshire tonight. David Romney was expected to win. So does he look like the inevitable nominee now for the Republican Party? Yeah, I think so, Lee. I mean, obviously, Iowa, New Hampshire, I mean, he's on a roll. Uh, you know, what we're going to see, though, in South Carolina is uh, an all-out effort by lots of these candidates to stop him. But, you know, the problem here, Lee, is that, and I know you're a sports guy, so think of it as a basketball game. You know, Romney is the one guy scoring all the points for one team because he's appealing to Main Street Republicans, independents. And then you have the other team that is appealing to evangelicals and social conservatives in the Tea Party, but the problem is they got a lot of players on the team. They got mm -hmm. Gingrich, they got Perry, they got Santorum. They're all scoring a bunch of points. They're splitting up the scoring. Yeah. That's the problem. So really, Romney at this point could even win South Carolina if Gingrich and Perry and Santorum continue to split the vote. And that looks like what's going to happen down in South Carolina, too. Right? I, don't know if, I don't know if you saw this up in Manchester tonight, but Ron Paul, or at least uh, his, one of his top aides, is calling for the other candidates to drop out of the race. They're maintaining <laughs> that he is the only anti-Romney candidate. Have you heard, heard about that? Uh, I've heard uh, a little about that. I can tell you this, though, that, uh, you know, Ron Paul actually may be a problem for Mitt Romney, really the only potential problem for Mitt Romney, and here's why. Uh, Ron Paul is appealing to independents in this country, uh, or at least within the Republican primary. Uh, Mitt Romney is also appealing to independents. So Ron Paul is taking those independents away from Mitt Romney. Look what we saw in New Hampshire tonight. Uh, Ron Paul took about half of those independents, uh, Mitt Romney and, and Ron Paul splitting those. And so if you have those independents going to Ron Paul, and then you have all these other conservative candidates uh, as well in the race, uh, you can indeed see a whole host of problems for Mitt Romney if Ron Paul continues to stay in the race. So we'll, we'll see. What, what is prompting these other candidates to stay out of the race? And, and do you <laughs> expect tomorrow that there might be an announcement or two from some of these candidates that they will drop out? No, I don't think there's going to be any announcement. Uh, Newt Gingrich, we have talked to him this week, talked to his campaign handlers. Gingrich is in this thing uh, in South Carolina. As a matter of fact, Lee, during Romney's speech, Newt Gingrich, uh, his campaign put out a new campaign ad in South Carolina, put out a press release, and now it is running tonight in South Carolina about Mitt Romney and Planned Parenthood and abortion that took place in Romney Care in Massachusetts. So Gingrich is in. 
Santorum is in for sure. Ron Paul's in, and Rick Perry's down there. So no one's going anywhere in South Carolina. And once again, this is part of the problem. If you're not a Romney fan, this is part of the problem, yeah. at least, which is that none of these folks are going out before South Carolina. Now, after South Carolina, different story. The one that is pulling the worst out of those three, P Perry, Gingrich, and Santorum, will get out. Ron Paul's going to stay in this for a while. Newt Gingrich really ramped up his attacks uh, in, in New Hampshire. Uh, it, it didn't really seem to hurt Romney, though, did it? No, it didn't. Um, as a matter of fact, what really hurt Romney more than anything, and it wasn't really reflected so much in the poll numbers tonight, but what you can start to see develop here is what John Huntsman is saying. Now, John Huntsman, who came in third here tonight, is starting to say it's not so much that Mitt Romney used that line, I like to fire people, and he was really wanting to fire people. It wasn't so much that, but Huntsman said, Look what we have here in a candidate. These are Huntsman's words saying that Romney is gaff prone. That, you know, why would he say I like to fire people when he knows people are coming against him about firing people when he was part of Bain Capital? So, uh, you know, John Huntsman may be on to something here, which is that these candidates are going to start to make the argument against Romney that do we really want a candidate like Romney going up against Obama who can be potentially gaff prone in the future? All right, as we wrap things up with you in Manchester tonight, David, when do you suppose we might uh, ha have a nominee? <laughs> well, I can tell you this. Mitt Romney is up in the polls uh, in South Carolina by about eight points right now. He's also up in Florida by about 10 points. If he wins South Carolina, Florida as well, good night, nurse. Katie, bar the door. <laughs> it's over by February 1st. Do you like all those cliches? Can I give you a couple others, Lee? Or sure. do we have time? For Absolutely. About, well, about really 30 seconds. Time. No, I, I, 30 seconds worth of cliches. No, I don't really have those, Lee. <laughs> but I, I can tell you that uh, by February 1st, uh, what will happen at that point is all of these conservative candidates will say, you know what, he's won South Carolina and Florida. Forget it. We're out. Let's coalesce. Let's go be President Obama in the fall. You were in Iowa last week, uh, last week, New Hampshire this week. You've done a great job for us. Get some rest and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, David. Thanks, Lee. And our political editor, John Waggy joins us now for more analysis of tonight's New Hampshire primary. John, until now, the GOP base has been kind of lukewarm towards Mitt Romney. Why is that? And do you think they're now warming up to him? Well, it's, it's more than lukewarm. I think they've actually had antipathy toward him, wondering if he, he or they believe he's a moderate, not a conservative. And when the Republicans nominate moderates, they usually lose presidential elections, and that has a lot of conservatives troubled. Just in the last 24 hours, there's a new CBS poll out showing that 58 percent of Republicans nationally want to see a uh, want to see another candidate in the race, another candidate entirely in the race. So, what, does he, what does he have to do to convince people that he's not John McCain? Well, I think one of the things he has to do is uh, he has to com win a few more primaries. If he keeps winning, the conservative resistance to him is, is going to drop. I think it's dropped already some in New Hampshire when we saw the tactics that Newt Gingrich was using, and he was attacked by fellow conservatives for using Democratic tactics against uh, Romney uh, as far as capitalism and that kind of thing. That, that's and, kind of shocking to me to hear Rick Perry and Newt Gingrich do that because they're playing to, to Obama's base when they yeah, do that. Yeah, and that's only going to send them spiraling further downward yeah. uh, among conservatives. And they, they need conservatives uh, to beat Romney. And if they're going to upset conservatives, uh, that's no way to keep in the race. Right. John, you and I were standing here and we were watching the Mitt Romney uh, press conference tonight was he met right. with his supporters and then Ron Paul that yes. was an incredible uh, reaction that his fans had mm -hmm. for him yeah. what, what do you make of, of the Ron Paul phenomenon does it have more legs through South Carolina and into Super well, Tuesday well absolutely Ron Paul was in it th through the long haul uh, last four years ago and now he's even more encouraged by the results and his, his supporters don't want him to drop out. And there, it's a strange collection of people. You've got some evangelicals in there. You've got strong anti-war people. And it's this anti-war component of his audience that doesn't agree with him on social issues, but they love him apologizing right. for the United States. And young conservatives. And young conservatives, young yep. people. Mm -hmm. John, and, and libertarians. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Rick Santorum is calling on Republicans to elect a true conservative, reaching out to voters in South Carolina today. Let's take a look. We have a message that can appeal not just in South Carolina, but across this nation, and in particular in the states.
that are necessary for us to win this election. Now, Rick Santorum uh, didn't do as well tonight as he did in Iowa. He, uh, he had a strong showing in Iowa, but can he rebound and do well in South Carolina? He can, but the question is, will he? And uh, as David had mentioned earlier, these other conservative candidates aren't dropping out of the race. And so Santorum has to be viewed by most of them as hi him being the most electable of the conservatives that are elect uh, left in the race. And that's, that's pretty tall order. John, what are you expecting to see as we move to South Carolina and then on to the Super Tuesday primary? Well, you know, it, it is still so early in the race. The candidate who wins needs 1,145 delegates. And Romney himself, who's in first place, has only a handful. So South Carolina, 11 days away, that state has basically chosen the Republican nominee correctly every time. If Romney wins the trifecta, there's really not going to be much reason for people to stay in the race. Now, some of them might to Florida, because Florida is a huge state with a lot of uh, uh, delegates at stake. But other than that, uh, as David said, we, we could be seeing the end of it by the end of January. They, they say that, you know, the experts say that running for president is a great training ground to be president. Do you sense that Mitt Romney is gaining a stride that could propel him into the White House? Well, he's certainly made few mistakes on the campaign trail so far, and he's weathered a lot of attacks. He's been the front runner from the very time the candidates started announcing, and uh, he, he hasn't really been hit too deeply on any issue. Now, what he's going to face if he does win the nomination is a barrage unlike anything we've seen from President Obama's billion dollar war chest. He doesn't have the numbers to match. Romney on the issues. His, his, his negatives are very high on handling of the economy and important things like that. So this is going to be a tear down Romney campaign yeah. if, if yeah. he in fact wins the nomination. John, we always appre appreciate your analysis. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank and, you, Lee. and of course, we will have more election updates and analysis of tonight's New Hampshire primary. That's tomorrow right here on the 700 Club. In other news tonight, the U.S. Supreme Court has heard a case that could change the power of federal bureaucracies and their ability to control private property. This case involves a couple that tried to build a house on their own land and a federal agency that told them they couldn't. Paul Strand has more. Mike and Chantel Sackett were just trying to build their three-bedroom dream home overlooking Priest Lake, Idaho, when the Environmental Protection Agency turned their dream into a nightmare. And so began a legal battle that's now ended up with the Sacketts fighting before the U.S. Supreme Court. The Sacketts were preparing this lot for their home when the EPA ordered them to stop, alleging it was a wetland, though there was nothing wet on the land and no neighbor on any side had ever been found to be on a wetland. Then the EPA threatened to hit the Sacketts with massive $37,500 a day fines unless they restored the land, fenced it off, and let it sit for three years. Can you imagine that? Going to bed every night with that on your mind? By now, we're up over $40 million in fines. It's literally terrifying. These small business owners face the very real possibility of financial ruin. What's led to this case is that the Sacketts found the way the federal rules are written, they couldn't take the EPA to court to argue their case. That government's here to serve us, and they're not. They're coming into people's life, turning it upside down, and making it to where you can't fight back. So they've sued with the help of the nonprofit Pacific Legal Foundation, declaring this is about the most fundamental rights in America, property rights. EPA, like any federal agency, is not a law unto itself. Even EPA must abide by the constitutional protections for private property rights that our founders enshrined. And people like the Sacketts can't have their dream home and their dreams to build that home trampled upon by an agency run wild. Apparently, the justices appeared sympathetic to the Sacketts' plight and critical of the EPA's claim it should be free of judicial review. They were as exasperated by that assertion as, as we have been, and so to that extent, it was gratifying. I was very hopeful when you hear some of the questions that were common sense questions to ask. Uh, I was um, elated. So now it's up to the court to decide whether a federal bureaucracy's power and whims are so important they outweigh the property rights of the average American. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Supreme Court. We'll be following that case and let you know how the high court rules. Doctors in Texas are now required to show sonograms to patients wanting an abortion. The law passed last year, but a judge issued a temporary order preventing its enforcement 
But today, a federal appeals court in New Orleans said Texas can enforce the abortion law while opponents challenge it in court. Doctors will describe images seen in the sonogram, including the fetal heartbeat. Jonathan Sains of the Liberty Institute in Texas called today's ruling one of the most important victories in the past 10 years. He said women and unborn children in Texas are no longer subject to the abuse of abortion doctors who deny women critical medical information. Well, Tim Tebow's performance Sunday in Denver's upset win over Pittsburgh sent people flocking to the Internet. The game made John 316 the most searched item on Google. Now, take a look at these numbers. Tebow passed for 316 yards. He averaged 31.6 yards per pass. And guess what CBS's ratings for the game peaked at Sunday afternoon? You guessed it, 31.6. All those 316s had fans searching the Internet where they found the famous Bible verse where Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Tebow sometimes painted John 316 on his eye black when he played uh, college football at the University of Florida. Florida. That's a practice that the NCAA, by the way, has since banned. Pat Robertson and Terry Mewson will be along with more of the 700 Club right after this. Something inside of me just told me I need to get checked out. The doctor said we found something and we need to get into surgery. Beth Gomez had stage three colon cancer. That's when we scheduled an appointment for a second opinion at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. To find out more about treatment options for complex and late stage cancer, go to cancercenter.com. You'll be able to see our treatment results for many types of cancers and how they compare to national averages. You can also check for participating insurance plans. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, every resource, every one of us, everything we do every day is focused on you, our patient, your treatment, your healing, your survival. You had a whole team. I wasn't just going to fight this battle. They were going to stand beside me and fight it. Our physicians, clinicians, and nurses are highly experienced and dedicated. We use state-of-the-art technology and give you treatment options you may not even know exist. Cancer makes you really appreciate what's important in your life. Please call or go to cancercenter.com today. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Care that never quits. Tomorrow. From the fattest city in America, one pastor challenges his church. What we do with our bodies matters to God. And gets them to lose a ton of weight. Plus. They don't really like us. And she didn't like them. It's us and them. One former racist gets a lesson in diversity. All things are possible. Tomorrow on The 700 Club. The phrase EU, you, uh, is a Greek for good, and genix is uh, uh, genes or, or race, and uh, so eugenics is the theory that the human race can improve itself through selective inbreeding. That was preached by Margaret Sanger of Planned Parenthood. And interestingly, the great liberal Oliver Wendell Holmes said, three generations of imbeciles is enough. You know, let's, let's sterilize them. So uh, for decades, state governments, including the one here, 31 states ran so-called eugenics programs that targeted uh, well, it was the poor and the minorities, but supposedly mentally defective so they wouldn't breed and, and just make a problem in society. Well, the state sterilized some 60,000 Americans involuntarily. At least they were tricked. They didn't quite know what was going on. Charlie Israel has the story of <clears throat> one North Carolina victim who's speaking out about her terrible experience. When Elaine Riddick was just 13 years old, she became the victim of a brutal rape. The person just jumped from behind a, a barn or a um, building and drug me to a car and just, you know, just molested me, <laughs> just raped me. It led to a pregnancy, and nine months later, she gave birth to a son. What happened after that delivery caused Elaine a lifetime of physical and mental pain. They immediately sterilized me at the same time, without my knowledge or without my consent. And I was just, you know, kept getting really, really sick, really, really sick. I was hemorrhaging. You know, I, was, I would walk in the street and I would just pass out for no reason at all. After that, I started going to a private doctor and the doctors told me that I had been butchered. 
At 19, Elaine married. It wasn't until they tried to start a family that she learned she could no longer bear children. So now, then, that my, when they went in to sterilize me, they had so severely damaged my fallopian tubes until they could only patch one back up, and the other one, I don't know what happened to it. It was later revealed that the state of North Carolina ordered the sterilization after a decision by the state's eugenics board. At one time, 31 states had a government-run eugenics program. In North Carolina alone, close to 8,000 men, women, and children, mostly poor, black, disabled, and uneducated, were forcibly sterilized from 1929 to 1974. The answers that they're giving me, I don't like them. Because when I asked them the same question, why? You know, this, their response is because I was feeble-minded. In 1927, the U.S. Supreme Court endorsed aspects of the eugenics movement. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote, It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Author and historian Edwin Black recently testified before the House Judiciary Committee's subcommittee about the history of racist eugenics in America. The um, genocidal uh, actions uh, of the American eugenicists were um, not conducted by men in white sheets b burning crosses at midnight, but by men in white lab coats and in three-piece suits in the fine corridors of our great universities in the state house, in the courthouse, and in the medical society. This was all subject to the rule of law. Eugenics is also blamed for paving the way for today's selective abortion practices, in which babies are aborted because of their race or sex. The results of abortion on demand in America today is that between 40 and 50 percent of all African American babies, virtually one in two, are killed before they're born. I just think it's outrageous in a nation where we're so interested and in, in appropriately so in protecting women and minorities, yet we turn such a blind eye to the fact that um, that children are being boarded just based on their skin color, just based on the fact that they're little girls. In 2002, the governments of North Carolina, Virginia, Oregon, and South Carolina issued official apologies to victims of forced sterilization. North Carolina is considering compensating survivors, providing between twenty and fifty thousand dollars to each verified living victim. Elaine says that's not enough. I mean, to me, twenty thousand dollars is a slap in the face. It's a big insult to what added on to what you've already done to me. Meantime, she has completed a college degree and says her faith has helped her to forgive those who robbed her of life. If it wasn't the God in me or my recognizing him within me, or if I wasn't having those communions with him, I don't know where I might be. Today, Elaine enjoys being a mother to her son, who has gone on to become a successful entrepreneur. She is also on a mission to help other survivors find healing. Just being able to be a, a mouthpiece for others that cannot speak for themselves or will, are afraid to come out or for the ones that it happened to and probably that might be dead and wanted to say something and couldn't say anything. And I recognize my mission and I'm going to fulfill it. Charlene Israel, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you who was the leader of the eugenics movement, Margaret Sanger of Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood, according to recent figures, has received close to five hundred million dollars in annual contributions from the federal taxpayers. They provide about 300 million abortions a year. Is it 300 million? 300 million? I'm Three, not sure about that. Well, I don't know what the number is. 300, 300,000? I think it's 300 million. But anyhow, an enormous number of abortions. It's an abortion factory. And uh, they promulgate the teachings of Margaret Sanger. I would Look it up on Google, Margaret Sanger, and the monograph is called Breeding the Thoroughbred. Look it up, get the copy of it, where she lays out in great detail why 
black people are inferior. Southern Europeans are inferior. Evangelical Protestants are inferior. And she went down the list. And these people, uh, basically, she wanted to sterilize. She wanted to limit their ability to have babies because she wanted to breed the, quote, thoroughbred. And Adolf Hitler and the, the people that whole concept of the Aryan race took a great deal of, of, of uh, material from her and the people she was associated with. This is, these are the people who are getting close to a half a billion dollars a year of taxpayer money that we have to borrow from the Chinese or somebody in order to pay for. That's what's going on. So when you hear about the Republicans wanting to take away the funding for Planned Parenthood, just think eugenics, think of forced sterilization, think of Margaret Sanger, and get that piece of paper that she wrote called Breeding the Thoroughbred. Read it for yourself. Important. It is important. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, coming up, he led the New Orleans Saints to their first ever Super Bowl win, and now he is gunning for a second. It's an unbelievable feeling just to have that trust and that confidence and that faith that if you do things the right way, good things will happen to you. Drew Brees talks about football and faith and why he nearly walked away from the game. That's all next. One the publishers clearing house sweep things. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my god. I can't believe it. <laughs> Watch your mail for the publishers clearing house sweepstakes or go to pch.com and enter. This February 29th, you could win 1 million dollars every year for life. Hello? Hey, handsome. The McCann Twins for Consumer Cellular. Where are you? On the street. I got a new cell phone from Consumer Cellular. They're all the same. Not true. They're complicated. Uh, but expensive. I... Long-term contracts. Cancellation fees. My plan is just $10 a month. $10 a month? I didn't have to sign a contract. I... There are no cancellation fees. Uh, yeah, but... And I even got a free phone. And when were you going to tell me about this? Call or go to ConsumerCellularTV.com now for no contract plan starting at $10 a month, a free phone, and a 30-day risk-free money-back guarantee. Shipping is free. Let's call and get your free phone. Consumer Cellular is the exclusive wireless provider for AARP members who get special benefits and discounts. My first call. Hello? Hey, ugly. <laughs> call 1-800-368-6425 or log on to ConsumerCellularTV.com. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Okay, we've got a special feature, but before we do, Hang on a minute. this uh, over behind Miss the chair Maggie. is no, my come this wife's way, baby. little here. dog, you know what? Come here. Okay, Princess come on. Maggie. Come on, go see your come dad. Here. Come here. All right, bring, okay. come here, Maggie. Come here, sweetheart. Now I'm a dog trainer for you for crying no, out loud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this on, is what happens here. when you stick around for a while. This is an <laughs> Irish water spaniel. and How she big is, is she going to get? Oh, she maybe get to 50 pounds, 49 pounds, something. Isn't she, she sitting on Isn't your she pretty? You better enjoy oh, yeah. that while oh, you can. She's a sweetheart. She just, she's got more life. And, uh, Maggie, you are a beauty. Isn't she sweet? Oh, like she's a little, gorgeous. Little, yeah. Well, she, and soft as can very be. Very soft. She's, this is <laughs> Princess Maggie. Uh, you know that you, you're a princess. You know she almost looks like she has one of those old, those old British yeah. <laughs> wigs on. Well, <laughs> her hair is going to get all curly and pretty, and uh, she's she beautiful. Is just, uh, Hey, she's still got puppy fur, doesn't she? Oh, totally puppy fur. She's only like uh, what, uh, twelve weeks old or something. She's just uh, a baby. Maggie, that's a tongue and a half you got there, girl. Yeah, <laughs> hey baby, <laughs> isn't she nice? You got yours and three other dogs. <laughs> okay, sweetheart. <laughs> Okay. Say, am I done, Dad? Oh, and the leopard collar. The leopard, leopard collar. Print collar. All right, well, she wants to go see Pete, Maybe. so let her go see Pete. There she goes. And uh, uh, last week, the New Orleans Saints blew out the Detroit Lions in the first round of the NFL playoffs, thanks to no small, in no small part, to their cannon-arm quarterback, whose name is Drew Brees. The former Super Bowl MVP is fresh off a season that saw him set a record for most passing yards in a single year. And recently, CBN's Sean Brown sat down with the former Super Bowl MVP to talk about football, his family, and most important, his faith. Watch this. 
It was the day that New Orleans Saints fans waited on for over 40 years. The day their beloved Saints would finally win the Super Bowl. It came on the leadership and arm of game MVP and quarterback Drew Brees, who did what many thought was close to impossible. An unbelievable feeling. It's, uh, it's surreal to think that uh, it actually did happen. But a great story isn't just about the ending. It's also about the journey. Drew and his younger brother Reed grew up in Austin, Texas, and football wasn't his favorite sport. Baseball was my favorite sport, and I, and I played all sports. I, I was really just one of those kids that, you know, me, my brother and I were just sports junkies. I mean, that's, we, every free second we had was out in the yard pitching to each other or tackling each other or, you know, playing tennis or, you know, just running around. I mean, whatever it was, it was very, always athletic. But by high school, Drew excelled in football as a quarterback. He looked forward to playing at the college level, but in his junior year, he suffered a torn ACL. And at the time, his future in football looked dim. I had seen a lot of my friends tear their ACLs, and some of them hadn't come back as, as good as they were before, you know, not as fast, not as uh, mobile, uh, whatever it might be. And, and so the thought of a torn ACL was devastating to me because I thought that I might be in the same boat as them, which was I, I wouldn't come back as strong. One Sunday at church, Something the pastor said changed everything. I was 17 years old, sitting in, in, in church one day that, uh, you know, with, with a torn ACL, crutches, just kind of wondering, you know, what, uh, why, why if, if, if football were not here for me or if, if sports weren't here for me, you know, what, what's my calling in life? You know, what, what am I, what's my purpose? What am I here to do? You know, what's God's purpose for me? And uh, for some reason, all hit me is his call to the, the congregation was that God was looking for a few good men to, you know, carry the torch and to represent the Christian faith and to, uh, you know, to, to lead. And I, I just remember thinking to myself, man, I, I'd like to be one of those few good men. Drew became a Christian that day. And with a new purpose, he was determined that nothing would stand in his way. God. Um, does have a purpose for me that's much greater than football. Drew went on to finish his high school football career with a 28-0 record. He spent the next four years at Purdue where he led the Boilmakers to the 2001 Rose Bowl. And though they came up short, there were bigger things in store for Drew that year. He was drafted by the San Diego Chargers. He spent five seasons there until he dislocated his throwing shoulder while trying to recover a fumble. And once again, Drew's future in football was questionable. I was given a 25% chance of coming back and playing by, by some. And that was, uh, that was, that, that could very easily put a lot of doubt in your heart. But uh, ever since, you know, that moment in high school, uh, when I truly accepted the responsibility of, of being a Christian and uh, accepting Jesus into my heart and knowing that I'm, I'm living for a lot more than myself, I'm living for, for him and, and, and the call that we all have as Christians. I. Uh, I knew that my, my, my faith uh, was, was strong and that as long as I relied on that and knew that there was a plan and I just had to believe it, I just had to trust it. In just two months, Drew had fully recovered. But by then, the Chargers organization had decided to go with Philip Rivers as the starter. So Drew decided to move on. He had two choices, the Miami Dolphins, a team on the rise with championship potential, and the New Orleans Saints a losing team in a city still picking up the pieces from Hurricane Katrina. Here's Miami. Nick Saban was a first-year head coach the year before. Had, they went nine and seven. They won their last seven in a row. I mean, they were a team on the up and up. And then here's New Orleans, <laughs> which is a first-year head coach. You know, nobody knew what to expect out of Sean Payton. Um, a city that had just been completely devastated by Hurricane Katrina, 85% of the city underwater. The team had been displaced. 3 and 13 record, coming back, hobbling back. And these are my choices. And so from, from an outsider's perspective, you would think that the obvious choice would be the Miami Dolphins. And yet when you get past the surface and dig a little bit deeper, you see the heart and soul of a city that uh, just needed somebody to believe in them. And here I was just needing somebody to believe in me. During their visit to New Orleans, Drew and his wife Brittany saw the devastation of Hurricane Katrina with their own eyes. I think that's when Brittany, you know, both looked at, and I both looked at each other and thought, "This, uh, 
this is much more you know than just coming to be a part of a team this is coming to be part of something much greater and that is um, the rebuilding of a, of a city. Drew signed with the Saints in 2006. Four seasons later, he led them to not only their first Super Bowl, but to victory. It wasn't just through football that Drew has become a beacon of hope to New Orleans and the state of Louisiana. Together with his wife, Brittany, he founded the Breeze Dream Foundation to advance research in the fight against cancer and to help rebuild what was lost in Hurricane Katrina. Drew has also written a book entitled Coming Back Stronger, which chronicles his journey with the underlying message of never giving up and following God's plan. I live for, for God, for the faith that I have in Him, and knowing the sacrifices that Jesus Christ made on the cross for me, and just feeling like it's in God's hands. And all I have to do is just give it my best, commit the rest to Him, and everything else is taken care of. I mean, that, that takes a weight off my shoulders. I think that would take a weight off anybody's shoulders. And it, it, it's to give you confidence to know that you've got somebody looking out for you. It's in God's hands. He's got it right. It's in God's hands. It takes a weight off your shoulders. What about your future? It's in God's hands. What about your marriage? It's in God's hands. What about your children? They're in God's hands. What about your career? It's in God's hands. If you'll trust Him, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. He is God Almighty and He'll bless those who trust Him. What a great example. We've had <clears throat> two football heroes who are preaching a gospel that perhaps millions of people would not hear anyplace else. One's Tim Tebow, now is a you know, very big star, and Drew Brees, MVP, Super Bowl winner, maybe coming up for another one. So anyhow, our hats are off to these guys. We appreciate their stand, and I ask you to pray for them because they're, the pressures on these people are enormous, that so they'll stay humble and grounded in the Word. Terry. Well, still ahead, we're going to bring it online from our live chat room, and there's still time to send us your questions. If you'd like to do that, log on to CBN.com right now, and we'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Coming up later. I screamed and cried, and I eventually learned to not scream and cry. At seven years old. These were some uniquely evil kids. While walking home in the snow. I thought that's about as far as it would go. A boy's life is forever changed. What happened next was uh, only what you would classify as rape. If you're the mother of a child with behavior problems, I'd like to talk to you. My name is Janet Lehman, and I'm a behavioral therapist and a mom. I know what it's like when the child that you love becomes a defiant, out-of-control child who disrespects you. That's why my husband James and I created The Total Transformation, the program that tens of thousands of moms are now using to turn around their child's behavior. If you've heard about The Total Transformation and wondered if it will work for you, now you can try it for free. I'm willing to give away a thousand programs today for free. All you need to do is get the program and let us know how it works for you. We'll let you keep it for free. I know the total transformation works because I used these techniques with my own son and with troubled kids for over 30 years. Let me prove to you that it works by giving you the program free. Call the number on your screen now to get the total transformation free. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. New York City police arrested a city councilman and three clergymen who were protesting the possible eviction of worship services from public buildings. About 60 congregations meet in New York public schools. Last month, the City Department of Education told the churches they must stop holding worship services in city schools after February 12th. The department cited separation of church and state and a recent court decision. But now the city housing authority says it's reviewing its policy on renting space to outside groups. The protesters were arrested Thursday when they refused to move from the entrance of the city's law department. 
A suspected terrorist targeting Tampa, Florida is behind bars. Authorities have arrested this man, Sami Osmakash. He's described as an Islamic extremist from Yugoslavia. Osmakash is accused of plotting to attack crowded locations near Tampa, including nightclubs and a sheriff's office. The U.S. Department of Justice says the suspect recorded an eight-minute video shortly before his arrest. In it, he said he wanted, quote, payback for the wrongs that he felt were done to Muslims. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Do you have wrinkles and sagging skin? Would you like to remove years of aging from your face in about an hour? Now you can with Lifestyle Lift. This amazing procedure takes about one hour right in our office. See the difference immediately. No general or IV anesthesia. Return to your activities quickly. Call now and get this informational kit free. Financing available. Lifestyle Lift. America's experts in making you look younger. It gave me back all of my confidence. Call now and get this informational kit free. As a child, Robert Brown lived in fear. He was afraid of leaving the house and afraid of his own memories. That's because when Robert was just seven years old, he saw evil itself. On a blustery winter day in Massachusetts, seven-year-old Robbie Brown walked home from a long day of sledding with his friends. Just ahead, he saw some older boys who were known to be bullies. They dragged Robbie into the woods. I was um, ordered out of my snowsuit. I was physically forced to, uh, to undress. I thought that's about as far as it would go. What happened next was uh, only what you would could classify as rape. They did run off when they were done and I was left there to kind of put myself together and head home. Rob staggered home. He couldn't find the words to tell his parents what had happened. All he ever said was that the older boys were mean to him. It most certainly was the day my life changed. A seven and a half year old can't comprehend what that was. I mean, these were some uniquely evil kids. Rob started carrying a knife for protection. The next time the boys headed his way, he'd be ready. The next week, one of the boys approached Rob. He gashed the boy's hand, avoiding another attack, but his plan backfired. Other parents instantly found out about the knife incident and the police showed up. I was told by my parents that if anything ever happened again, I'd be off to juvenile hall. The kids were all told that. So I had basically cornered myself into checkmate. Now Rob was trapped. Do what the older boys said or go to jail. For the next seven years, Rob was raped by the four boys an estimated 20 times. Hey, Control was completely taken away from me. I was literally a prisoner. One of their threats was, you, you know, you comply or we'll tell your parents what you do for us. The level of horror after hearing something like that uh, is rather intense. He withdrew from family and school friends and was plagued by nightmares and suicidal thoughts. It was just hell visiting Earth. I know I screamed and cried, and I eventually learned to not scream and cry. The abuse ended when the boys graduated. To Rob, there was nothing to live for, but he still believed in God. I would have many conversations. I used to call them, I still call them my mirror conversations, where I would look into the mirror and I would have long conversations with God. Feel free to kill me anytime now, God. Feel free to take those boys to hell. Later that summer, his older sisters met a street evangelist and became Christians. They invited Rob to spend the summer with them in Cape Cod, where they introduced him to the evangelist. 
I had seen the worst side of humanity possible, that I certainly was never going to be qualified, never going to be qualified to go to heaven. So the street evangelist was introducing a whole new concept. Ask Jesus to be your savior, and he will. And that my only path to real life into a happy life and eternal life was through Jesus. And one morning I asked the Lord to come into my, my life and my heart. And I said, I, I, I surrender, I give up, I'm yours. I shed this heavy, weighty burden out of my heart. And I fell backwards over that rock and I just was bawling my eyes out. That was, was miraculous, palpable salvation. For the first time since Rob was seven, he says he felt free. Rob found a church and received help from a counselor. He now runs his own marketing company and is an advocate for child abuse victims. I'm strong because Jesus gives me strength. God's grace gives me strength. I am nothing without God. It's taken many years for Rob to open up about his past, but he says it helps him heal. Another milestone was forgiving his abusers. If Jesus will forgive them, who am I to not forgive them? I am going down a path of healing with the most powerful therapist uh, possible, and that is Jesus. Rob talks about going down a path, you know, when you've been very wounded in your life, the way to healing is a journey. But he also talked about the most powerful psychologist, psychiatrist. Jesus is the one who created you. He knows every fiber of your being. This is what the Bible says about God's plan for you and for me. It says that we are created in the image and likeness of God himself. We are a God idea. God has an enemy who hates him, and because we belong to him as his creation, he hates us as well. What do you think he delights in doing the most? Breaking that image, making us feel like we can never be worth anything, like our lives are useless, making us wanting to snuff out the very gift of life that God has given us, putting us in a position where we're checkmated by him, our backs are to the wall, we don't see hope, everything is dark. Rob found a very important thing in the midst of all of that, the gift of forgiveness. You know, it started when he opened his heart up to Jesus after talking with that evangelist, when he said, God, I, I'm just going to surrender to you. I can remember that place in my own life where I said, there's not much left, but you can have what it is and do what you want with it. Take my life, God. Take my life and make it matter. If you're in a situation today where you've been used, abused, deeply wounded, your heart is filled with anger and bitterness, with anxiety, frustration, hopelessness, there's only one place you can go to find wholeness, and that's to the one who created you in his own image and likeness. Here's the amazing thing about him. He can heal that. He can restore what the enemy has stolen. He can renew, he can recreate, he can do whatever needs to be done to bring you back to wholeness in him. And then he'll use your life for something that matters, but most importantly, he'll love you. Completely, unequivocally, you don't have to get good enough, you can't get clean enough, none of us can. He loves you right where you are. He's got plans and purpose for your life. Are you willing to embark on the journey? Let's do right now what Rob did. Let's run to the only rock that's safe to stand on, Jesus Christ. You can have a fresh start right now, this moment. Pray with me. Pray with me the same prayer that Rob prayed. Let's pray right now. God, I don't know how to get to you. I'm trusting today that you're here wanting me just like you wanted Rob. 
I don't know how to get rid of the things that are inside of me that are eating away at my life, but I'm giving it all to you today, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I am a sinner. Things have been done to me, but I acknowledge I am a sinner in need of a Savior. So first of all, Jesus, I want to do business personally with you. Will you forgive my sins? Will you be the Savior of my soul? And then I'm asking you to be the Lord of my life. Take my life. Take all of it. Heal me. Teach me. Touch me. Use me. Change the way that I think. Help me to know you and to love you with all of my heart. And to be able to receive everything you want to be and give and do in my life. Oh, Jesus, I just want you. I want to know you. Take me today. I surrender my life to you in Jesus' name. And I'm also asking you, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with the power that I need to move forward into your plans for my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer with me today and really meant it in your heart, then you've begun an unbelievable relationship with the only one who can make us whole. We want to help you grow in that relationship. So Pat's put together a project called A New Day. This is a little pamphlet filled with information from the Word of God. What do you do now? Now that you've committed your life to Christ, how do you grow in this relationship? This is absolutely free, and so is the phone call to receive it. Our number is 1-800-759-0700. Just call and say, I prayed that prayer today, and I'd like the New Day packet. We'll get this out to you right away. And you can also get it by logging on to CBN.com. Pat? Thank you very much. Telephones are available, folks. You can call in. Somebody's here who cares about you. Well, still to come, we're going to be answering your questions from our chat room. <clears throat> Kathy says, quote, my husband is addicted to porn. Soon we'll be going on a tropical vacation, but I'm worried that he's going to spend his time leering at girls in bikinis. What should I do? Well, that and more when we come back. clearinghouse sweepstakes or go to pch.com and enter this february 29th you could win one million dollars every year for life well lots of you've sent questions into our chat room and pat this first one is from kathy who says my husband is addicted to porn we've prayed about it gotten counseling but his addiction has gotten worse not better we've managed to cope with this for years but i'm getting worried soon we'll be going on a tropical vacation and i'm worried that he's going to spend his time leering at other girls in bikinis what should i do better to be leering at real girls in bikinis than mythical girls in porn he's got to be delivered there's an addiction there's a spirit of lust that has come upon him and the only way to deal with it is to bind Satan's power and cast that thing out. You need a, the same kind of thing that you would do if you, you had somebody who's involved in heroin addiction and, and you have an intervention and people come, you've got to confront him with it and lay it on the line. You can't continue this. And I might add, if you continue in a relationship with somebody like that, uh, you're becoming an enabler. And you've got to stand up and say no more. All right. And you need some accountability, too. You know, just counseling through something like that is, if, unless you want to change. There's a, got to be intervention where there's a, uh, you rebuke Satan. It's absolutely. a spirit of lust that has come upon that man. He's got to be set free. All right. And this is Linda who says, my brother stole more than a million dollars from my mother and me. 
My mom had to move in with me. She's not forgiven him, but I have. We're having a hard time making ends meet because of the missing money. My husband told me to forget it and move on, but I want to confront him. My brother doesn't seem like he's sorry for what he's done to us. Do I obey my husband or confront my brother? Look, it's your call. I don't know what to tell you. It's, it's your own family situation. Um, you say he stole your money. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to forgive, but I honestly think that in a thing like that, there are law courts, and I think he should be brought to justice. I mean, he's... And she doesn't say how the money was stolen. You well, know, I, I know. It, it's, it's very difficult, mm -hmm. Terry, but that's why you don't know what to counsel. But I, I just believe in a situation like that, it isn't enough to just forgive and forget. He's not asking for forgiveness. And the Bible says if they ask for forgiveness, give it to them. He's not asking for it. And I, I think there needs to be a certain amount of justice. You and your mother have been impoverished because of what this man has done to you. And I think he should pay some of the money back. And so, but I, I don't know the circumstances. So, yeah. but in my opinion, it would be one of those things where you ought to get a good attorney and see what you can do about, you know. Find out what your rights are Jerk in the situation. chain a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right. And yeah, this is Bally who says, I've been married for a year, and recently my husband has told me that he wants a second wife. He already has a girlfriend and says he wants to marry her. He doesn't see anything wrong with his decision. Am I still bound by the marriage vows we said? Uh, not if he's catting around that way. If he, really, if he really wants a second marriage, let him have her, and, yeah. and uh, that becomes, you're out. Well, I mean, that's what the Bible says. Uh, uh, adultery is is a ground for divorce. Well, he sounds like he's he's he thinks bigamy is all right. Well, uh, I mean, there are many people. Muslims think it's okay. Four wives is cool, and uh, the old uh, Mormons used to think a number of uh, marriages, and they have those sister wives and all that. Yeah. Um, it's your call, but in my opinion, I, I'd say no way. And according to the Bible. Uh, your husband has obviously hasn't grown up yet. He he sounds to me like he's terribly immature. Yeah, they've only been married for a year. Yeah, I mean it's it's weird, it's but uh, you don't have to stay in a thing like that. No. All right. This is Amanda who says my husband has always been an excessive spender. The Lord has blessed him with promotions, but we still struggle because of his frivolous ways. Every time he gets extra money, he spends it on himself. I even began using coupons to save money. I've tried to talk to him, but he gets mad and walks away. After 10 years of this and three children, I'm fed up. I just don't know what else to do since paying bills isn't a priority to him. Help. My dear, you married him. I keep saying that. You married him. You knew what he was dealing with. And uh, uh, here again, it's immaturity. And maybe counseling would work. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Sometimes you threaten if you, if you don't shape up or else you just say, look, I, I'm going to stop marital relations with you until such time as you begin to show responsibility in relation to finances. But he will cripple you all for the rest of your lives. You will be financial cripples. And what's going to happen is you'll wind up in old age and you won't have any money. So, I mean, it's a terrible thing, but yes, they're immature people. That's what we've been talking about is a number of immature people, and, you know, they need to grow up. Well, that's all the time we've got for today's show. Tomorrow, I meet a pastor who called his congregation fat, and then he helped them lose a ton of weight. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you later. Bye-bye. I like that. From CBN, an adventure for the whole family. <laughs> Give it back. Ooh, make me. Do something. Get Superbook and start the new year learning the truth of God's Word. Join the Superbook DVD Club and get Superbook's newest episode, Roar, the story of Daniel, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of $25. Anyone who prays to any god or man except to the king shall be thrown into the lion's den. Your membership means the fun and learning keep coming every month. With your continued support, you'll receive three copies of each new episode. It was almost like he didn't care that he was going to get thrown to the lines for praying. Superbook DVD Club. It's a wonderful way to build a strong spiritual foundation in the children you love. In a way they'll love to watch the whole year through. Superbook Roar, the story of Daniel. Available now.